This is Sergeant Dave Matthews at gmail.com with the Remember the Fallen podcast on klrnradio.net in which every Thursday night I will be voicing for our veterans into infinity. I'm back with vengeance after the survival instincts of an eight-ton rollover accident in the Pawan province of Afghanistan in 2004 where I lost my 19-year-old gunner, Brandon J. Wadman, who was sitting right next to me. Please Google his name to read the whole story. I emerged from a pile of hurt soldiers on Old Kabul Road and returned to the States with even a more enduring tale of perseverance. As I navigate through the riddled and troubled rapids of the VA system, I gain a new perspective that I will share with you with the fever of enthusiasm to all patriots across the windswept fields of America. You see, one of us can be run off, Two of us can be disregarded, but a podcast audience, we are a movement. All right, here we are live at the Remember the Fallen YouTube studio in Seminole County, Florida, USA, on the Winter Springs Oviedo Line. We're doing a special segment podcast tonight. It's about our women in the military, our armed forces. Hear Her Roar is the title. So, women are the fastest growing demographic among all veterans in the United States today. About 9% of the roughly 9 million veterans treated by the VA are women. A percent of the department, Veterans Affairs, expected to double by 2040. To meet this demand, the House Veterans Affairs Committee announced the creation of the Women Veterans Task Force last year to identify and eliminate barriers women face when trying to access the VA care, including reproductive health for women veterans, residential treatment programs, and economic opportunity. Specifically, the task force is focused on four areas, ensuring a welcoming and inclusive VA, providing equity and access to a VA health care, including women-specific care, such as and improving economic opportunities for women veterans and their families, and guaranteeing that women veterans have equal access to VA benefits, including education, disability, and pension benefits. We have this growing population of women veterans who served during a time of war, and we know that they're experiencing the same impact on their health as men, said National Legislative Director Joy Yem, who has been participating with the task force. When they receive VA care, one apparent truth is a lot of these service and programs were designed for men. Some of the nuances don't shine through for women. That's what this show's about tonight. It's an exciting and important time to witness the evolution of genders, roles in the military, said Aiyam. Our charge now is to make sure we support that evolution by putting in the place appropriate measures to provide all veterans the care they need and deserve. I want to thank very much is this great article on the DA, on the DAV magazine uh, of this Terror Roar. So I'll get to show you again, once again, about this article. Here it is right here. Hear Her Roar. All right. So we're going to continue about her role, okay? More than 700 female soldiers have been allowed into previously restricted combat jobs out of the roughly 65,000 women in the Army. You do the math, that's less than 1%. In 2017, a woman was accepted into the Army 75th Ranger Regiment in an elite light infantry unit that operates alongside the Army's most prestigious commando teams under the Joint Special Operations Command. Okay, here's the most recent attainments from uh, women in the military. It's a subtitle, She Made It. A female Green Beret showing up at a special forces group for assignment to Operational Detachment Alpha, ODA, or A-Team will be groundbreaking for the regiment. Everything that she has done so far in special forces is groundbreaking. Now, special forces, we call them snake eaters. I wonder if she's eating snakes, right? That is, until she deploys to combat. In combat, she will join the silent sisterhood of women 
who have fought and died alongside their brothers in arms throughout our nation's longest war. Did you hear that? The silent sisterhood of women. Hope this show is gonna this is gonna change that, okay? So Navy here's another one. Here's another recent attainment. A Navy SEAL. Navy marked at first earlier this year when a woman completed a Navy SEAL officer assessment and selection military com has learned, right? First female Marine earns recon military occupational specialty. The first female Marine has passed the basic reconnaissance course and earned the 0321 Reconnaissance Marine Military Occupational Specialty, or MOS. The Marine Corps confi- confirmed Lance Corporal Alexa Barth graduated from the grueling 12-week course November 7th. First Lieutenant Sam Stevenson, Marine Corps spokesman, confirmed to Marine Corps Times Thursday. Okay, just recently in Washington, a National Guard soldier is set to become the Army's first female Green Beret. Hoorah! In coming weeks, according to military officials, following the Pentagon's opening all combat and special operations jobs to women in 2016. The woman in an enlisted soldier is in the final stage of training before graduating from the roughly year-long qualification course, or QS, as a Special Force Engineer Sergeant. Her graduation is almost guaranteed, officials said, although occasionally soldiers have failed the course this late in the training or withdrawn because of injuries. A spokesman for Army Special Operations Command will not release any information on the soldiers, citing security concerns. The soldier is one of only a handful of women who have passed the initial 24-day assessment program that acts as a screening process before the qualification course. The weeks-long screening regimen tests candidates on fundamental military schools skills, including land navigation and marching with heavy combat gear, before they are evaluated by Special Forces supervisors and either denied entry or accepted into the qualification course. Well, that's the first segment of our podcast, Hear Her Roar. I'm going to be speaking to three other women that are involved with the military, the advocates, two are enlisted, prior military. So we're going to speak. Okay, here we are with our first host this evening. And we have Kathy Costas from WoundedTimes.org and Point Man Ministries. She's the editor and publisher of WoundedTimes.org and editor and publisher of ptsdpatrol.com. She's the author of three books and produced over 400 videos. And she is just big on the ptsdpatrol.com, so please go to that that website and check that out. Good evening, Kathy Costas. So glad to hear from you. I'm so proud of what you've been doing for our women and our men in our military. But tonight's episode, we're going to just highlight what women have been doing lately so let's hear what you got to say about this right here why with all the accomplishments that the women have right now why are female veterans feeling their service is less honored you know thanks for having me on tonight a lot of it is the attitude of the general public and i mean they come home they you know they do this service and if you have a male and a female veterans sitting side by side and they're both wearing military hats, people will thank the male for their service. That's not right. No, you know, they've they've proven themselves time and time again, but it's the attitude of of the general public. They just don't see it. Right. And I tell you, these last few years have been paramount. I've never seen such a push. These women, and that's why the show's called Hear Her Roar, because they are they are roaring in there, in the in the troops, you know. They're doing some amazing stuff, you know. So uh, what does the public get wrong about women in the military? What is up with that? Well, they get they get a lot of things wrong, according, if they just haven't read any history of it. When you stop and think that women have been in the military before there was a U.S. military, fighting the Revolutionary War, it, it's really just mind-blowing to stop and think that, they really know very little about women in the military. People are often shocked when I say women have gotten every medal of service that the males have. They're like, oh, no, they haven't. They didn't get the Medal of Honor. And I'm like, oh, yes, they did. It was Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, Medal of Honor recipient from Civil War. Awesome. And then how about that woman who... uh she actually wore bandages over her breast to make her look flat, and she dressed like a man through the whole uh, Civil War. Do you remember her name? Absolutely. And it's, I actually did a video on, on those women 
I think she was the first one to get disability pay. All right. So why um, why does the public get it wrong? Tell me more about that. There, there's a really, here's a really good key. When you mention a male with PTSD, right? Where does your mind automatically go? It automatically goes to combat, right? Oh yeah, definitely IEDs. Okay. When you hear a female has PTSD, where does your mind go? Usually it goes to military sexual trauma. MST. Yes. And you know there's a when lot of that going hear, on. When you hear a female has PTSD, right away, it goes to military sexual trauma. Uh, no, it's actually going up. The thing that a lot of people don't understand is that there are males in the military that go through sexual trauma. And a female, right away, you don't stop and think about what they go through serving side by side with males, exposed to combat. You know, you, you talked about you know, women, women going into your know, special forces and you know, army ranger, navy, seal, you know, the whole bit. But they don't stop and consider. They experience the same traumatic events, males and females. But the brain does not think about females in combat. I remember our last episode. The um, the female had she was turned down thirteen times for a service dog. Because the first question they asked was, were you in combat? And she wasn't. So she was denied 13 times because she couldn't show uh, proof that she was in combat. Remember that one? You know, she, she went to all these different organizations to get a service dog. And, you know, when she said it was a military sexual assault, they said, oh, we can't help you because we only do combat PTSD service dogs. And it's like, uh, okay. Does it make sense how? But it, it happens. Right. Are you spearheading that? Are you going to assist her with that? Are you going to run that up the flagpole? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're trying all different ways to, to just get this thinking process changed. You know, too many women are, are coming back, and I mean, especially now with, you know, the COVID-19 virus, they're telling everybody to isolate, when for decades we've been telling veterans the worst thing you can do is isolate. Now they have forced isolation. For female veterans, it's, it's even worse because they don't have the same support system behind them. Right. So they will go to these groups that, that are mostly males. They feel totally out of place. So that's another reason why Poignant is doing veteran outpost. We're doing the first one up here in, in New Hampshire. We're looking for female veterans from New Hampshire and Maine because they were going to meetings all over the country. Yeah. But there would only be one or two females in the group. And they felt very out of place. So the, um, the the board decided that, you know, they need their own groups to go to so that they can find the support. A lot of them are, are feel shamed, right? They don't want to be known in the public that they had MST or they have PTSD. They're, they're ashamed, you know, because they're warriors. I think that could be no, some reason. It, 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 no, it's not, so, it's not so much, you know, feeling ashamed and, and being in the public because people have actually come to grips a little bit more with PTSD because it happens in the civilian population. There's over 47 million uh, Americans that have PTSD. Attitudes are changing in, in the police departments and firefighters and emergency responders. Attitudes are changing because you have PTSD in, in doctors and nurses and uh, all different fields and then you have PTSD in, in survivors of you know traumatic events from just living as, as a regular person. I'm a 10 times survivor. Yeah, how about like the Orlando Pulse? You know, that was a lot of PTSD yeah. that night, you know, going on. Yes. With the, that was, oof, 40, what is it, 47? Oh, that was just a terrible night. So what can be done to change the conversation, Kathy? Changing the conversation is, is like what we're doing now. And if you go on social media and you're reading something stupid, says something totally out of place, you know, when it comes to males and veterans, male veterans and female veterans, call them out on it. Right. Give them the facts. That's the only way the conversation is going to change, is if the rightful voices overcome the deceitful voices. That's the only way that we're going to change the thinking process, because military women have a rich, rich history in this country, and they should never be treated like, you know, second-class veterans. Can you help us out there? We want to help the audience and, and try to help... Building, build, okay, building up support is getting them to stop isolating and getting them in touch with others just like them. Like Team Red, White, and Blue, they have a lot of women veterans at that peer support group. Yeah, I mentioned that today at one of our classes. 
Um, because there is a lot of women veterans that are exercising as well with the guys. So, yeah, I'll have to bring that up, pair support, um, team red, white, and blue. Yeah, they, put need, on. They, they need their own, and then they don't feel as isolated or that they have to continually prove themselves with the males. Recovery is not a contest. It's a joint effort. So when you're working together and you're side by side with each other, you've got recovery mm-hmm. because you've got that, that support system going. But, you know, if you're looking at, okay, well, I'm working out with males, so i got to show what I can do. No, it's not a contest. Right. You know, they really need their own support network. Yeah, the alpha male is very competitive, especially the military alpha male. I've seen a lot of that in my time, you know. I, I did experience one time where a female E6 staff sergeant had a leadership role, and I could see her struggling. It was so sad to see because... While the other squad leaders were having meetings with their men in their barracks, she couldn't. She had to come in at a certain time when everybody was out of the shower. And they had to say, women on the floor. And everybody had to snap, watch out, make sure they had their clothes on. So it wasn't comfortable for the guys, her coming in the barracks. So it was extremely difficult. And I watched it from a distance. And I'm saying, wow, this is not going to work. I don't know how she can continue that role. And wouldn't you know, she was relieved of that role because it wasn't working. It, the environment wasn't there. And there's not enough female veterans to have their own squad, you know? It's, so it's going to be difficult for them to have a leadership role. What do you feel about that? Uh, that's actually false. That's actually false. The, uh, let's talk about leadership in, in the veteran community. No, I'm talking... Hey, uh, okay, hold on. I'm talking actual combat. Okay, I'm talking prepping your soldiers for deployment when you have after hours, when other squads are getting together after the training during the day. They get together at night for a couple of hours, right? She couldn't yeah. do her job at night. So that squad was it was falling behind because they didn't get together enough after hours. That's what I mean about that. Okay, so I've, I witnessed it. I saw it. Go ahead. I know what you mean by in the community, yeah. I'm talking about deploying, getting ready to do your, your your combat infantry skills and stuff like that, your land navigation, all that, to come together for a team. And they and she just couldn't seem to get there on time. And they only spent 15 minutes with other squads where I had over an hour. Because by the time she got over to the barracks, it was already late. Guys were already passing out. They're already exhausted for the night. They're ready for lights out, you know. But that's her, that would be a reflection on her. You know, it's not easy. They should not have to prove themselves over and over and over again. But if they can't end up being leaders, then they should, you know, just find another MOS for themselves. Because women have fought too long and too hard to get into these leadership roles. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, two female generals that made history because they're sisters. Hmm. Only because they're sisters, right? Well, they, they made history, yeah. <laughs> two, two sisters, both made generals. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, there, there are difficulties, and, and men are going to be, you know, uh, basically chauvinistic to a lot of them, but it's up to the woman to actually uh, basically set them right. Yeah, and that's difficult. To let them know yeah. she's not going to be bowled over. Right. One of, one of my friends, she was stationed at uh, Fort McClellan. Alabama. The Vietnam War. Alabama, she yep. was a cap. She was a captain, and uh, she was gay. And some of the guys found out about it, and they decided to teach her a lesson, so they gang raped her. Oh, terrible. Guess what? Yeah. She, she reported him. She didn't shrink away, and she finished serving her time, and... She was just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But she ended up fighting for all veterans after that, you know, especially, you know, military sexual trauma. She She fought for males and and females. She just, I mean, she was a real leader, you know, but attitudes were a lot different back then. You know, a a lot of women think the attitudes are bad now. They should have been around during Vietnam. Well, any any last uh, comments before we uh, sign off for the next host? Because we have a couple more. They'll be coming on. Any last comments? Uh, A veteran female, male, especially older ones right now, pick up the phone and call them because this isolation with COVID-19, it's one of the worst things that a veteran can do is isolate, but health-wise, it's the best thing that they can do right now. 
So pick up the phone and call him. And if you don't understand anything about military history and women, the backbone of this country, please look it up and find the facts so that we can start changing this conversation because they really need our help too. And most of these groups, they're not even talking about them. Clear the road. Change the conversation all the way around. So clear the road, right? Absolutely. Clear the road. Take the, take their lives back. All right, Kathy, thank you so much for a great episode. And once again, go to WoundedTimes.org and also PTSDPatrol.com, PTSDPatrol.com. She follows up every day. She's got some incredible stuff. Follow her on Facebook or, or, or Instagram, whatever whatever you need to do. And, and I just want to appreciate all you do, Kathy. And we're going to pick this up. Every six months, we're going to do a show on, and Tell us uh, how how uh, the progress is. Okay, Kat? All right. Thanks a lot, Dave. You, you have a good evening. Take care now. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. As we look forward into today's 2020 progress of our women in today's military, we can't forget about the sacrifice of the woman before this elite Hear Her Roar group. So as I uh, go back a few episodes back at the AMVETS convention, in 2019, I want you to hear these stories from the women that sacrificed before this Hear Her Roar group. I'm going to just talk a little bit about open the airwaves of, of women's veterans' issues of their challenges. So we know um, they don't use the word Romeo, Alpha, Papa, Echo anymore, right? They don't use that anymore. They use something called MST. Could you explain that to me? sexual trauma. It's uh, the phrase that encompasses a lot of um, the women's issues like the harassments, the, uh, the physical touchments, the uh, person you're making you feel like you owe them something or even down to the sexual rape section of it. Oh my god. You, you gotta, it's enough you're going through a uh, like you said earlier, a male's, male's uh, military and you're going to go through all of that. And um, so Touch up on a little bit of what you feel. How can you fix something that's such a men have such control over over the women in the military? How do you fix something like that? You stand up and you say you have a right to be there. That uh, you know you have a right to serve the country as much as anybody else. I was a single mother, and I felt that it was my duty to help protect my country and my family. Great answer there. Yes, I, I believe so too. And uh, Vanessa. Being in the medical field to on another field where uh, maybe you know the men had a little more respect because you would help them when, when they were bleeding. That's when they wanted you. You know when they needed something from you, they were obviously nice to you because they were hurting. So how did what was your experiences? As, as far as what happened to me, yeah. is that what you're yeah. asking? Yeah. Anything that happened, uh, any kind uh, of experience? Well. I've come to explain it as the, the biggest type of betrayal that could occur because um, when when you train, when you go through your training, the soldier to your left, the soldier to your right, the soldier in front of you, the soldier behind you, you're all battle buddies. You're all supposed to have each other's backs. And um, one of my fellow service members um, went to the barracks where I was at and uh, drugged me and did things that in the civilian world Right. Who came out of that? Were you able to press charges? Was there anything? No. Nothing like that? No. Because, because of the cultural climate, had I come forward to um, even report it, um, would have been further ostracized than what I was as being a, a female soldier. Um, when I did talk with someone the next day, um, I was told, you can't say anything. My... Um, fellow soldier who lived in the same barracks, the same dorm that, that I did, she had been gang raped prior to when I was raped by several service members, you know, in our in our unit. She reported it, she needed medical care, and um, because of that, and because of her ostracization and the way she was treated after, after that for reporting it, she attempted suicide. She attempted. It was not a successful um, 
attempt. Um, I happened to be on duty the night that she had attempted suicide, so I wasn't in the barracks. I, I wasn't there to, to have her back, to be someone there for her to talk with when she needed that support. I didn't find out until the next morning when I had finished my 12-hour night rotation at the hospital, and they said, we need a nurse to go up to the ICU and sit with with someone because they're, um, they were short-staffed, so they needed some help. And I said, okay, I'll go, you know, I'll go help, even though I had just finished a 12-hour night shift myself. Um, I didn't know. No one warned me who it was. I didn't know until I walked into the room and there was my friend, my sister soldier, hooked up to the machines and everything to keep her going. And um, all I could do was sit with her during the time till they were till they had someone else to, to relieve me of that duty. And when she would stop breathing, um, tell her to breathe. I didn't know what had happened to her for a number of years after that. Fortunately, um, I ran into her when we both were back stateside and uh, saw her at the pharmacy at the um, at the post hospital where I was was at then. And um, she told me she said that you saved my life. It was you telling me breathe because she didn't have that will to live anymore. She didn't want to go on anymore because the pain was so severe. That level of betrayal that she experienced from her her brothers in arms and then the way that she was treated after when she reported she lost all will to go on. Thank goodness you were there, Vanessa. God bless you for that. You know, more people like yourself need to be with these soldiers uh, when their time of need is and yeah, you can't, that cult is like a culture within the military, there's no, no doubt about it, and I haven't seen, I've seen a little bit of change, I've been reading, you know, the magazines and stuff, um, but it's still, the, the commanders are looking the other way, and, and it's so wrong that court marshals are going on, uh, just get them out of the army and, and put them in jail, that's just it, just put them in jail if anything comes up like that, so... Do um, you have another thing, another thing you want to mention? That's fine. Okay, Vanessa, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm helping to advocate for the Military Justice Improvement Act. With that, then when a military sexual trauma is reported, if this act goes through, as I understand the way that it's written now, then instead of it being the commander who gets to make the decision, it will go to the proper authorities to do the investigation, to make the determination on how things move forward. Because one of the issues with when, uh, whether it's a male or female veteran, reports a military sexual trauma is that it can get sidestepped in the process if the investigation isn't handled in a particular way, you know, um, then the, the information can be lost in order to prosecute for sexual trauma, for sexual harassment, for rape, things, you know, anything that falls under the MST umbrella. The information as far as the investigation is, is critical when you go in to try to prosecute. If that information is lost, then the, the victim of that trauma is re-victimized through the process and then has no chance of any vindication or justification for what happened to them. Yeah, I can see they need to open it up to civilians. Uh, civilians need to step in on at the bases, allow them in to do their proper investigation right away. Well, with the military, um, with this, this, uh, in the just the military justice improvement act. I believe I've got that right. That right. All right. Um, it would go through the post. Um, it would be the post IG. That would do the investigation. Okay. Or, so yeah, the post so inspector general yeah, would, would be now involved in not, let's just say, the platoon sergeant of, of, of the soldier. Because, of course, the platoon sergeant's going to look over it. Or the commander, they want to keep their personnel. He might be in the good good old boys club, right? right. So we got to get away from the good old boys club and open it up to the local authorities, police authorities that are in the 
that jurisdiction. And, and then you wouldn't have this, and because you, they have too much bias going on. So I can see the challenges you women are going to in the military. Now, I was, uh, when I went through the military, it was the first time they allowed soldiers to be, women soldiers were being blended in. This is 1982, which was, I was shocked. That was 1982 was my year, and the women were actually on the second floor, and we were on the third floor, right? So you know there was flirtation going on. There was a lot of stuff going on. And I was shocked to see that some soldiers would, you know, actually be distracted with that because that was their main thing. You know, they were totally distracted with the women being that close to the men in the barracks. That's un- that shouldn't be. I think it should be separated, have their own barracks, not that close to the men. So I, I saw that uh, when I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama in 1982 as well. So, so you're saying by separate stops it? No, it doesn't stop it. You're right. It doesn't stop it, but it's so close proximity. What, so they, they can sneak up control themselves. Well, they they can sneak up into their their, their bunks. That was just way too close. Or meeting the fire and, and the fire stairwell. You know that one. Uh, that was what's happening. That was happening late at night. Predator, it yeah. doesn't matter if you put them in a different barracks or if you put them in the same barracks. If they're gonna be a predator, they're gonna be a predator. It doesn't matter where you separate them at. They catch you in the motor pool. They catch you in the combo section. It doesn't matter. If they're gonna put it, you know, if they're gonna attack you, they're gonna attack you. It doesn't matter if you separate them or not. Yeah. Right. And then one of the conversations that, that we had is that when you know it's an environment like with the military, you know, that's more closed net. Um, and then these individuals who are being predators, they're honing their skills. If it gets reported and it gets brushed aside, and, and so they're, they're forgiven or. or you know, if they're not prosecuted for it, then when they get out, they have honed their skills all the years that they were in getting away with it. Oh, so now you're saying that there are uh, professional, you know, sexual assaulters out in the streets, basically. They didn't say professional. <laughs> okay. They, they're skilled in they, such a they, way. They have... Yeah. Right. They have honed a skill. Yeah, they honed a skill. Being able to perpetrate yeah. a sexual. But they, they, right. they didn't get caught. They didn't get in trouble. So, hey, you know, I can do it again and nobody's going to say anything. Yes, yeah. I understand that, yes. So, with, uh, with the women's with, with job and rank and, and promotion, how does that affect I didn't get the mine. women? You didn't get to... I didn't get mine. I was gang raped by five men. Okay, I took it to the MPs before anything was said or done about it. Within a week, several of them had been transferred to Germany. One of them said that because he was drunk and high, he didn't know what he had done. So he got drug and alcohol treatment. That was okay, always punishment. I ended up pregnant. Didn't know who the man was that was responsible because it could have been any of them. So they came up with a choice that I could go to Germany for two years, have my baby over there with no family support, or I could stay stateside, have my baby, leave my va- baby with my family, and then go over by myself while my son was raised the first two years, what? or take a discharge. What a decision, Ray. Oh, my God. That must have been a tough one to make. It was. Do you mind sharing us what your decision was? I went home. You went home. So you, you're a mother of this child, yes. and hey, God bless you. I mean, you know, some things, uh, something like that, that in life happens, but you brought a, bit, a child into the world, and you were able to, take, your family's able to take care of her. But the and, society, or the civilian life turned on me, because even when I went home and I had gotten married, I even had family say, oh, well, is that from your husband or is that from somebody else? Yeah, family can be really brutal, huh? This yeah. is civilian people. Civilian people as well. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing I've seen is, is promotions not there for the women. They're, you know, tucked aside, uh, not being seen. 
and, and the, but then you see on the veteran service organizations how many women that are, are in charge or they're running the American Legion or the DAV. So I'm seeing a lot of that in the veteran service organizations where I see women commanders are stepping up. That's why I joined the admits program. I joined the admits program because because of what happened to me. My discharge, I mean, my promotion papers were there. My discharge papers came down the same time, and they said, well, your discharge is here first. I wanted to be a career soldier. I got put out as a PFC because my rank was not accepted because my discharge papers were on top. So I only got to serve a year and a half, put out because I was pregnant, uh, because I didn't want to leave a job behind, and I didn't want to be over in a foreign country where I couldn't speak the language and just have a brand new infant. So um, I joined the organization. I am now, I, I, I found a, a post up in, in Farmington, New Mexico, so that I could stand up and help other women so they don't have to go through what I've gone through to help them get the programs because today we still have uh, MST counselors at the clinics. Um, they want to do the, the Vietnam or the combat and stuff, but nobody still wants to touch military sexual trauma. You get well from some of the good old boys. What well, you knew what you were getting into when you joined the service. What did you expect? Oh, what a terrible excuse for being a predator to commit such a heinous crime. Um, just unbelievable. Um, so MST uh, needs to be addressed uh, in, in all aspects of veteran service organizations, of uh, course, through the military and stuff like that. So we want, definitely want to keep that going, the MST and the VA system. So I would like to thank these two brave ladies for telling their story. We won't hear the last of MST, military sexual trauma, in our military, especially when these elite women are being accepted into the Army's most prestigious commando teams under the Joint Special Operations Command. We only can hope that the Me Too movement will resonate into today's military with severe punishments like Harvey Weinstein received. All right, it's getting zero dark 30 for the show, and before I relax, never and go into rack ops mode, go to Sergeant Dave Matthews at gmail.com. That's S G T D A V E M A T T H E W S at gmail.com for suggestions for the next podcast content. And you can always comment me on my Twitter handle, at Heroic Memorials. And you can like my Facebook page. All one word now, remember the fallen. Well, until all our troops come back safe from Afghanistan, I will see you next week in our KLRNRadio.net. Remember the fall and show lineup. Remember now, it's in alphabetical order. Share it with your patriotic friends, for this former ground pounder would appreciate it. All right, let's all fall out. Pop smoke out.